morning, everybody. It's, it's nice to uh, see you all. <laughs> um, we are really privileged to have two great speakers with us today. Dr. Rebecca Howell, she is um, Division Chief of Laryn Laryngology at UC Health. And her practice involves the diagnosis and treatment of laryngological disease. Man, that's a long word. So what that means is diseases of the throat. And she helps with swallowing issues, professional voice, aging voice, and multidisciplinary care. And her partner in crime is Renee Gustin, who is a speech language pathologist at UC Department of ENT. And the two of them are quite the pair for all of our Parkinson's patients. So we're really grateful that they um, gave us this time this morning and I will give it to both of you. Thank you so much, Maureen. It is a pleasure to be here and to see you all virtually. Uh, while, while I think that um, you know, being in person is so incredibly important. I also think that these platforms are really nice because at least you can sit at home with a cup of coffee and you don't have to worry about getting out of bed or even dressed as long as you have figured out how to not show your video. Um, so thank you, it is an honor. Thank you for all of your kind words. Uh, Renee and I have given this talk a couple different times uh, to different groups for Parkinson's, for the, for the different Parkinson's communities and support groups. So with that being said, uh, Renee and I are going to get started. We are going to go back and forth. If you can't hear one of us, tell us. If you can't hear, see the audio or the visual, please tell us. And finally, we were chatting, you know, earlier, this, this can be, this doesn't have to be formal. We've got about 30 minutes of, of formal content here. Um, so please feel free to interject. If you have a question, let us know. Um, and we'll kind of go from there. All right. So let me hear your voice. So our objectives today is we're going to understand the three subsystems, the coordination of breath, voice and swallowing, which affects Parkinson's disease. As Maureen mentioned, I am a, here's another fancy word, otolaryngologist, which is a very fancy word for ENT, ear, nose, and throat. Uh, uh, Renee and I specialize on the T, the throat part. So that is what laryngology is. It comes from the word larynx. Um, and we're gonna get into some really neat anatomy, things that Renee and I, you know, in our biased opinion are really fascinating and interesting. Um, we're also going to understand the treatments for Parkinson's voice and swallowing disorders, what we know today and sort of the frontiers for the future. Renee? Alrighty. So I'm gonna take over for a few more, for a few of these slides and then I'm gonna hand it back to Dr. Howell. So we're gonna start with the basics. We're gonna start with some of the foundations, okay? So here are the three subsystems of speech. So speaking and singing involve a vocal mechanism that is comprised of these three systems, the respiratory system, phonatory system, and the resonating systems. And each of these subsystems is comprised of different body parts and, and each of these body parts has a specific role um, in voice production. So if there's any disturbance within one of these three subsystems or in the balance or in the coordination between these subsystems, that leads to a vocal disorder. So hypokinetic dysarthria is an example of a speech impairment that can disrupt any, um, or a secretary, sorry, that can disrupt any or all of these subsystems of speech. And unfortunately, 75% of individuals with Parkinson's disease will develop a form of this hypokinetic dysarthria or this speech impairment um, at some stage along their disease progression. So it is really essential for us to understand the mechanics of voice production and the roles that each of these three subsystem plays within um, within voice production so that we can early, we can lead to better early detection of this sort of speech disorder within the po population such as Parkinson's disease or Parkinson's um, 
Parkinson's speech disorders. So that's where we're going to start today, and we're going to sort of delve into this and then pull back out and talk about how we treat it. So Dr. Howell, you can hit my next slide, please. So here's the first subsystem, and this is um, the power source or the respiratory system. So to power the voice, we must have adequate airflow into the lungs, and then that flows back up through your windpipe or your trachea and subsequently sets the vocal folds into vibration on its way out. So if you look at the placement anatomically here on the screen, that V shape, if you look at that placement, that's where the vocal folds sit. They sit in a V formation right above, this is like a little tube, that's your voice, your windpipe. They sit right on top of your windpipe. So when the air flows through your lungs, through your windpipe, it sets those vocal folds into vibration. Um, so you have to have a strong stream of air coming up through the lungs to set those vocal folds into vibration. Otherwise, you're gonna have a weak voice. So you can't really have one without the other, a strong voice without a strong breath support. So a weakened respiratory drive or breath support is a common manifestation of this hypokinetic dysarthria that I mentioned on the previous slide. And it is so prevalently seen within patients with Parkinson's disease. So not only does a weakened breath support compromise voice production, it also compromises a person's ability to produce a strong cough. And Dr. Howell is going to mention the importance of a strong cough in a couple of slides from now. But essentially, a strong cough is integral to um, your ability to have a safe swallow, right? So if you swallow wrong, you have the ability to kick back out whatever went down the wrong pipe, which would be, in this case, your windpipe. So next slide, please. We're gonna move on um, to something that we do to help train better breath support. So this is called S expiratory muscle strength training or trainer, EMST. So when we have patients come in and um, they say we, they have a weak cough, weak voice, trouble swallowing or complaints of breathlessness, um, we commonly prescribe this. It's a little device called the EMST 150. And um, we will prescribe it as a component of their voice therapy. And EMST, um, this EMST device is like a little hand handheld device. You can see it on the, um, on the slide there. And it is designed to strengthen the respiratory muscles that are associated and involved in exhalation because we speak and we cough on an exhale. Um, and so studies have shown that this EMST strengthening um, device strengthens the muscles involved in coughing, swallowing, and voicing. So um, you can see an outline on this slide right here of um, what the training program entails. And um, pretty much condensed here, it's 25 training breaths a day. That is five days a week. And that is then for five weeks until you enter a maintenance program, which then, and then you, you would do it, I believe three times a week going forward to maintain your gains. But we have seen some phenomenal results in our patients with troubles with voice and swallow and cough um, who go ahead and commit to doing this EMST training device. All right, so we're gonna pop back now into um, discussing the three subsystems of speech. So we'll go to the next slide. And the next subsystem of speech is the phonatory system or what we like to call the sound source. And um, so we produce voice air pressure, um, when we produce voice, that air pressure um, below the vocal folds, again, passes through through the tissues, those two, those two little white bands of muscle that you can see on the screen there, and it sucks them together into that pattern, pattern of vibration, which is what Dr. Howell is showing you in that um, schematic. That's how the vocal folds sort of vibrate. They vibrate sort of convergent and divergent, so they sort of come apart. Here, let me bring my hands here come apart in a wave and then they meet in the middle and that's what makes your sound. So when the vocal folds open, we call that abduction. And when the vocal folds close, we call that abduction, they're coming together. And so now I'm gonna have Dr. Howell play a little snippet of true vocal folds in vibration. Yeah, so it's kind of crazy. And this is slowed down. So um, the vocal folds for women 
vibrate maybe 200 to 250 times per second. And in men, it's about 100 to 150 times per second. The vocal folds are tiny little muscles and you can barely capture them um, with the naked eye. So our strobe light, it's what we call performing a stroboscopic examination, would be using strobe light to then capture sort of a montage of pictures that we then are able to play and then analyze what the vocal folds are doing um, as they come together. So you wouldn't be able to see this with a naked eye. That's why we use the strobe light. All right, so back to this now, how this pertains to Parkinson's disease. So patients with Parkinson's sometimes have difficulties just getting their vocal folds together in general. And when you can't get those vocal folds completely closed during vibration or during voice production, that can be then um, result in the perception of a weak, breathy vocal quality. And when you can't get your vocal folds together completely during swallowing, you can choke, right? Because then you have um, you have one less level of protection of um, getting that liquid or food down, again, down the wrong pipe. So um, this leads with, to choking issues, especially with thin liquids. We notice because thin liquids move faster than food, patients with Parkinson's disease sometimes can't coordinate it fast enough. And then the thin liquid goes down the wrong pipe, goes down the trachea and into the lungs. So very important that we have good, efficient vocal fold closure and complete vocal fold closure, I should say. All right, so finally, next slide, we're gonna talk about the resonating system. And um, the, re the resonating system is the shaping source. So by themselves, the vocal folds produce a sound that sounds almost just like a simple buzzing sound. It doesn't really have a tone to it. And the structures above the vocal folds, everything that's above your neck, the back of your throat, and into your mouth and into your nasal cavity is what sort of colors your sound or gives you your individual tone. So the vocal tract is again, made up of your pharynx, your oral cavity and your nasal cavities. All right, so next slide. So now that we've laid down the foundation for these three subsystems of voicing, here's kind of the not so fun stuff. Here is a list of um, some of the most common voice and speech difficulties and complaints that are reported by our patients with Parkinson's disease. We see these all the time. So again, 75% of patients with Parkinson's will experience changes in their speech or in their voice at some stage along the disease progression. That includes reduced vocal loudness. That's probably the number one thing we hear at least for voice in terms of voice complaints coarse vocal quality, a monotone sounding voice, um, imprecise, imprecise articulation, and usually that is sort of perceived as a mumbling of speech or slurring of words, a vocal tremor, so that would be that the voice sounds like it's shaking a lot when you speak, and a change in speech rate, and unfortunately this is um, usually um, a speeding up of speech sounds. So, um, kind of along the same lines as the how the steps, how your steps might get a little bit faster and you have a hard time slowing down the rate with, with which you walk. A similar thing can occur with your speech sounds where you speed up how fast you talk and then it's harder for people to understand you. So um, we're gonna go to the next slide because when a patient comes in with any of these, um, of those complaints, our first line of defense is usually our good old faithful um, LSVT, Lee Silverman Voice Treatment. And um, many of you, if not most of you, have probably heard of LSVT. It's been around for years. It is a um, incredibly evidence-based um, treatment protocol. And so I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail about the LSVT here, um, other than to say that it is a highly effective, highly intensive, four week long course of voice therapy that focuses on vocal loudness to stimulate the three subsystems of voicing. So a patient comes in to see us 16 times in one month, that's four times a week for four weeks. And um, the results from LSVT are phenomenal. They are incredible, um, but um, I would say that it's not always for everyone. So if a patient can, and a patient in their family can um, 
can commit to doing this very intensive speech program, the research has shown that 90% of patients will, um, will maintain their gains, their speech and voice gains for well over two years after the completion of the therapy. So it's highly, highly effective, but it is also asking a lot from our patients and a lot from their families to get a patient to our clinic to work with us for an hour um, each session time four times a week for four weeks. So that's the caveat here, okay? So we'll switch to the, we'll go to the next slide. And um, what we wanna do now is switch gears and talk about what we do when LSVT isn't exactly going to work. Let's say perhaps it's a time commitment issue or a transportation issue or a monetary issue. What other things can we offer you as your voice and swallow team to help you um, if you can't go for the old faithful program? So now I'm going to switch it back over to Dr. Howell to discuss some of the medical interventions. Thank you, Renee. All right, so now I'm going to give you a little bit of an anatomy lesson. So we're going to get a little bit more into the weeds about what these things look like and then how they're affected. So as Renee said, these are the, the V is the vocal cords, or in this picture, it looks like an A. I tell my students, A points to anterior, how they can keep their balance, how they can keep their, their, um, their right side and upside in the clinic. Um, as you'll see in a second, we flip these images often. So you may, in some of these pictures, see upside down Vs and right side up Vs. It's all the same thing. It's just different cameras and different angles. So when we think about when we think about voice and swallowing, the anterior, again, anterior and posterior, very, very simply stated, will actually give you, oh, oh no. Sorry, give me one second, we will reopen this. All right, are you still seeing my screen or do I have to share it again? I think you have to share it again. Okay, now if you just put it in presenter mode, you'll be good to go. Perfect. All right, thank you. <clears throat> so thinking about, again, the voice and the swallowing, very, very simply stated. When, you think of, when we think about the voice, we think about the V and the most anterior part of the V. When we think about breathing problems, we think about this kind of lower part of the triangle. And then when we think about swallowing problems, we think about this, this, this circle or space in the back. So again, to the notion of, you know, going down the wrong pipe and why we talk about voice and swallowing and cough all in the same time is because they are very, it's actually quite remarkable that we do this so well most of our lives and for most of the time. The voice, as Renee said, it has to open and it has to be able to close appropriately in order to keep food and liquid from going down the wrong way. So our vocal cords or our vocal folds also have, so they have a function in voice, which is what Renee has talked a lot about, but it also has to do with our breathing. It has to be in an open position for us to be able to breathe appropriately. And it also has a place for swallowing. So I also think of it, um, as Renee said, you have your trachea on the bottom, the windpipe, and right on top, you have this V in the vocal cords right immediately behind it is that swallowing tube. So this is also the fork in the road. So this is why people choke. When we talk about choking and coughing, when eating especially, then this is the area that we always evaluate. And the reason again is because everything has to be very coordinated 
those vocal cords or the V needs to close appropriately in order to keep things from going the wrong way. So again, it's the gateway to the airway or the doors on the pipe. And it also, the lungs, in order to have a cough, again, thinking of these subsystems, the lungs have to develop enough support to push, squeeze, and shove the air through those vocal cords. The vocal cords close and then explode open, which is that sound then that you hear. A cough then, as, as many of you know, or a throat clear, helps to clear mucus, liquids, things from the airway. And so it clears them, so it gets them off of the voice box, away from the trachea and the airway, and back into either the mouth for you to spit out, or you are able to swallow it, and it goes down the correct pipe. So as Renee said, we have, we have some really fun and exciting technology that we get to use in the office. As you can see from this technical program, sometimes it works, sometimes there's glitches. But when it does work, it is really quite fascinating. It's quite unfair, but that is Renee. That's not a real normal. So as many of you have already know, known, or if you didn't before, Renee is a professional vocalist. She has a beautiful singing voice. And those are her vocal cords, her vocal folds. So normal, again, is you have a nice, beautiful white structure. They open and close appropriately. And then again, you see that beautiful wave. And then whenever we, Think of an instrument we lengthen to be able to get a higher pitch and we shorten those vocal cords to be able to get a lower pitch. And so again, in thinking of Parkinson's disease and coordination and again, tone and inflection. So those, those aspects of the voice and of speech that Renee was alluding to earlier that oftentimes in Parkinson's, it seems monotone. Right, you have one single tone and you don't have that nice inflection um, and you don't have changes in the voice. And that's again, because of the dynamic nature of the lengthening and shortening of the vocal cord and the changes in the vocal tract, which then create our sound. So as an alternative, this is an example of one of our Parkinson's patients. Okay, one more time, try a little bit higher again. Okay. Try a slightly higher pitch again. So again, what you can notice, and I'll play the clip again. I'm going to play both of these clips. I want you to hear again, listen for the different pitches of Renee's voice compared to our Parkinson's patient. Also, I want you to look at the closure pattern. So where those vocal cords touch. Again. So one of the things that we evaluate for in the exam, I tell folks that when we're doing their endoscopy, anyone who comes into our clinic, it's a voice and swallowing clinic, gets an endoscopy. Um, these are always done awake. They're done so that we can actually hear your functional sound. So I tell folks that we look for anatomy or form and function. So form is what we've gone over. So does everything look normal? Does the vocal folds, are there any cancers? Are there any ulcers? Are there any infections? Are there anything that we can see visually that isn't supposed to be there? And then we look for function. So if all of those things are okay, then we start to look for function. So we take patients through a number of different tasks. 
we say e, which causes those adduction of the vocal folds. Sometimes we have patients talk to see how fast they go. Sometimes we will do maneuvers like a sniff and an e. So e, e. What that does is a sniff opens and the e closes. So sniff, e, sniff, e. And in that way, we are testing not only the range of motion, but also the speed of motion. All of these things, again, are affected and will affect all patients, but especially our Parkinson's patients. So as Renee alluded to, LSVT or loud is, is the standard of care. It's the gold standard. Um, so in medicine, we talk a lot about evidence-based medicine. And so what that means is that there is literature to support the things that we are re recommending. There is a much research on LSVT and it is the treatment of choice. As Renee said, there are a lot of caveats to it. One silver lining of the pandemic is also that we do have access to telehealth. So much as we said, while sometimes even in platforms like this, in person is nice, but you have the option of doing a virtual session, which allows some of the pieces like transportation and caretaker fatigue to be taken out of it so that it's not a limitation. Again, with that being said, there are still a subset of patients that actually end up with needing more or interested in more. So what this is, is this was a study that we published um, back in 2019 in the Journal of Dysphagia. What we did was we looked at Parkinson's patients in particular and how they improve with what's called vocal augmentation. That is a plumping of the vocal cords and I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. What was fascinating and really fun about this is that we did it initially for voice. It's been known that this is an option for voice, although, there's because of what's known as it, what's known by all of our Parkinson's patients as the, the decline, the inevitable decline. Sometimes the argument is, well, why do something that's not going to work permanently? There are also permanent surgeries that can also do the same thing, which are which can be, patients can be candidates for, especially early in the disease. But what was really interesting is that not only voice improved, but actually swallowing improved. So swallowing improved a lot when we actually plumped up those vocal cords. So I tell patients in the office, think of Angelina Jolie lips, right? That's the plumping agents that we do. So oftentimes people say, well, is that Botox? No, it's not Botox, it's a plumping. So if you look here, these are again, remember this B that we talked about, there's a pre-injection on the left and a post on the right. So, and this is immediate. This is actually right in the bottom. You can even see the needle right at the bottom of the screen. So this is immediately afterwards. Um, and so again, very simply, it's a plumping agent. It's a plumping of the vocal cords. So why would it help with swallowing disease? So, because it helps with the cough. So it helps the voice. The things that I think it helps most consistently is as Renee said, volume. So volume is an issue. Um, vocal fatigue, so feeling like you're just exhausted by the end of a conversation. And then liquid swallows. The reason for the liquids, as Renee said, is it's, it is very thin and sometimes it just slips down the wrong pipe faster than solids. Solid foods or even thicker foods, the body, the mouth, the tongue has a little bit longer time to react um, than thin liquids. So again, form and function. I showed you that it looks different before and after. Now I'm going to show you that it functions different before and after. So again, this is our same patient before. Uh, one more time. Try a little bit higher again. Try a slightly higher pitch again. And after. Good. Good job. E. Good. He. He. 
Uh-huh. One loud E. Uh-huh. Good. So again, what you get out of it, you're not going to get normal. I tell folks, I can't make you sound like your 50-year-old self or your 40-year-old self. I also cannot make you sound like Renee. So a lot of times patients will jokingly say, well, can't you make me sing? Well, no. If you didn't sing before, you are not going to sing afterwards. Just because I have two legs does not mean anybody is paying me to run a marathon and earn money for it. So, but what we can get is functional voice. So form and function, when we get a voice that is able to be heard, which is important for safety, safety of of being, if you're in a home and you need to call out for someone, you have to yell out. We have this for our patients that are both at home with loved ones, as well as on their own, or even in a facility. But if you can't yell out when you need help, then it becomes a little bit more dangerous. Again, the other thing that we really noticed, which was fun about this study, is that swallowing improved. The cough There's been several studies about cough and the efficiency of cough. So the cough improves. So not only do those vocal cords come together faster, meaning stuff doesn't go down in in the first place, but what it also shows is that if it does trickle down, that cough, that generation of a cough actually gets better. And so even if something goes down the wrong way, you're able to expel it faster and more efficiently. So, Patients with Parkinson's, as I said, also have issues with swallowing. Swallowing, sometimes it's, it, we forget about these things or we don't think of them until we start to ask the question. But the reason that swallowing is important is because it can lead to different problems down the road. Mostly what, you know, what at sort of the, the far end is, you know, feeding tube dependence, or what's called aspiration pneumonia, which is, again, food going down into the lungs, causing pneumonias, causing infections into the lungs, which causes hospitalizations and even death. Aspiration, unfortunately, is the leading cause of death in Parkinson's, um, and mortality rates can reach up to 40%. Malnutrition, when people stop eating because they don't enjoy it, you become failure to thrive, right? These are all things that also are not, they're preventable. Feeding tube, as I said, is way at the far end and is not even gonna be a part of this talk. What we're talking about here is actually affecting the quality of life while you still have it and being able to maintain as much as possible for as long as possible. I tell patients in the office all the time, I, I, my job does not prolong life but it prolongs the quality of life that you have. That's what we do best. So Parkinson's disease patients may experience difficulty in chewing, eating or speaking or swallowing. This can happen at any time, but certainly we do see a change as the disease progresses. So do some of these different functions and activities of daily living. So swallowing, the mechanism of swallowing, swallowing simply stated is getting food to the lips, into the mouth, and then down to the stomach. So if there's any component of that process, then we call it dysphagia or a swallowing problem. Sometimes it's not even noticed because it's not the problem going down, but these patients start to cough more often. If they're coughing, if you notice one of your loved ones coughing while they're eating, then that's probably a good time to come in and come see us as well. When you're coughing with eating, it means that food or liquid is touching the vocal cords. It also means that you are able to cough and expel it, which is a good thing. It means that your sensation or your ability to feel is still intact, which is a good thing. Sometimes swallowing and the mechanism of of swallowing can produce problems in in, in, again, the quality of life or a decreased quality of life. Patients can become frustrated or embarrassed because they're coughing or it doesn't feel good or even worse, if they're getting Heimlich-like choking, you know, that type of choking where someone really feels like they got a wacky on the back, squeeze the chest. It starts to become a fear of not only patients, but the family that's around them. And when it becomes this problem, 
we also, and no more in this, in this pandemic have I ever come to realize, but you know, eating is such a part of our social being. So when patients start to really struggle, they start to not want to go out to eat. They don't want to go over to friends' houses to eat because they don't want the embarrassment. And so they become more and more socially isolated. So the quality of your life is also, again, affected by this. And as Renee and I said, liquids in particular start to go the wrong way. That usually happens first. And when that happens, so not only malnutrition, which is way farther down the road, but dehydration. Because when something's not fun, it's not enjoyable, you stop doing it. That's what our brains do without even really thinking about it. So here, um... Is just that summary of pretty much what Dr. Howell just um, reviewed with, with us all of the common symptoms of dysphagia or difficulty with swallowing that are commonly seen in Parkinson's disease. So I'm just going to um, race down this list here. Drooling, difficulty chewing, difficulty swallowing pills. That's a big one. We see it a lot. Um, losing weight without trying, slowness in eating or drinking, food collecting around the gum line. So food that's just staying in your mouth and not being swallowed with the rest of the bolus or the rest of the, um, of the food at the, at the time where you're initiating your swallow. Trouble keeping food or liquid in the mouth. So sometimes it comes out the front of the mouth, right? And most patients will tell me that's just embarrassing. You know, you, you want to be able to eat and, and not, um, and not self feel self-conscious about it. The sensation of food being um, stuck in the throat, we hear that a lot, coughing or choking before, during, or after eating and drinking, and the sensation of swallowing, taking effort, or feeling of fatigue when eating. We hear that a lot, right? And then that takes away from that, that fun, the fun, the joy of, um, of mealtimes um, when you're getting tired instead of just enjoying the social engagement and um, just the joy of food. So um, we're gonna wrap up the more formal part of our presentation um, about at least the therapy aspect here um, with just listing here the common treatments for voice and swallowing um, for patients with Parkinson's. So um, just like how exercise-based programs help other PD-related issues, movement difficulties, um, Exercise-based swallow voice and breathing programs work under the same premise. So be that EMST, that's that um, strength, um, expiratory muscle strength training program for breathing, LSVT, the gold standard of voice therapy for Parkinson's disease, or um, just good old fashioned voice or um, swallowing therapy, which is completed with a speech language pathologist. Um, we continue to recommend these tried and true therapies because we witness time and time again the positive impact that they can have on our patients' lives. And I just saw something in the chat about Speak Out. And yes, Speak Out and Loud Crowd is a new, um, it is a new intervention, relatively new intervention, which I think is also phenomenal, phenomenal. Um, there's just not the evidence base behind it just yet, just yet. They just haven't, the, the research field just hasn't been able to, um, to put in the studies to look at the true efficacy of Speak Out versus LSVT. So I love it. I love my patients who do it. And empirically, like personally, anecdotally, my patients who do Loud Crowd and Speak Out, they do amazing. Amazing. I, I am so thrilled with their progress. So yes, add Speak Out in there. As soon as, um, as we get the evidence to back it, then I'm going to throw it into all of my um, professional presentation. Um, but I think, Dr. Hell, I think you have one or two more points you wanted to make. Yes, what's next? So th there's another question in the chat about when should we seek, when should someone seek treatment or an evaluation? Mm -hmm. um, I have to tell you personal experience, I'll bring it up and oh no, I don't wanna do that yet. There's always that yet. 
So I think that's the point of the question. When should, when should yeah. we seek it? Well, I can quickly just interject and I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Howell for a voice therapy um, perspective. It is quality of life. If you are starting to isolate yourself, you are starting to hold back in conversation. If you're starting to get sad, if your loved ones are starting to notice that you are not engaging the way that you used to, you have a communication issue. And the sooner you address it, the better. So that's the therapy perspective. I'm gonna share this back again. Okay. Can you see this again? Yeah, it's good. Um, sorry, I lost my ability to talk. <laughs> Speaking of which. Oh. Give me one second, my computer just booted me. As Dr. Howell pulls that up, I'm just looking at the chat. And so, yes, we have two questions here about um, when to seek voice, um, when should a patient seek out um, a, an ENT team or a voice and swallow team? So, um, so quality of life, feelings of isolation, um, but also I have a lot of patients who have an early diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And they go to someone like the lovely Maureen and they get all of the information on interventions that they may need um, going forward. And I have a lot of patients who come to me before they're really having issues. And I love it because then you get the information, you get the therapies in place, you start to learn about what you need to be aware of, what you need to anticipate having issues with, and you start early. You always can come back and get a, get a tune up on, um, on what you've learned. But um, I have a lot of patients who are like, you know, I'm not that quiet. I'm not that quiet, but I'm starting to notice people say, huh? And I'm having to repeat myself. Um, that is enough to come in. You don't have to wait until you're, you know, really struggling to just seek out a little bit of therapy or a little consultation from your ENT team. Thanks, Renee. Sorry, I'm back. Can you still see my screen okay and hear me? Okay. Um, yeah, I think I think if there's, I think at any time, I think at any time it is um, warranted to, to come for an evaluation, just talk to your doctor, talk to your physician. Um, our neurology colleagues are all fantastic. I know we know a lot of the regional neurologists too. Um, so even if you're not necessarily a UC patient, you can go, you know, anywhere and you can certainly have a referral. I think there are many, many community um, speech pathologists that are also trained in LSVT as well um, and speak out and loud. And so I think, you know, anywhere that you can receive, you know, help, then I think is, is valuable. And if you're more of a, you know, we've got patients that want to do more and want to do it right away. At that point, it's great to come and see, even if it's just a baseline. So even if the answer is, okay, maybe you don't need it now or, let, let you know that we're a resource. Um, I think that's perfectly fine too. So I don't think there's a right or wrong answer for when, when to be seen. But I think if any, of, if any of the things that Renee and I have kind of spoken about today sort of like, you know, hit a nerve for you, let's say, come on in and see us. We've got a great team. There's three, we now have four, we have four laryngologists like myself. Um, we have nine speech pathologists, both voice and swallowing trained at UC. And again, we're happy to get you and plug you into to different speech pathologists and different teams that work with us in the community as well. So you don't necessarily have to drive to Clifton or have to drive to Westchester, um, but uh, that's where we're located. So, so I'm gonna keep going with what's next and then let's continue these conversations. Um, so, so what's, what else can we do? So again, defining, you know, really understanding better what those vocal for, what, you know, how much vocal bowing is what we call it, or that rounding of the vocal cords. So how much is too much? 
how much is not enough. We don't have good, we usually, as we said, form and function, really base this off of um, patient experience and symptoms. So we use the pictures to help us guide the treatment, but it would be nice to be able to give you better definitions for that. Um, also understanding better where and why the swallowing at the level of the vocal folds. I told you a couple of the different mechanisms, but some of them, we just don't have the ability to see or to evaluate fast enough. EMS, TNPD, as Renee said, we have, we have some, but how, how that affects swallowing, how each affects voice, how each affects, you know, compared to normal aging, more can be done. Controlled studies. Controlled studies are hard to do. Um, they're difficult, they're challenging. Um, here we go. But uh, one of the studies, so one of the studies that we have currently, go, this is currently enrolling. So um, the group, uh, this, is a, this is in Parkinson's disease and swallowing. This is at its very, very early stages. So what we're looking at here, so this picture that you get to see here on the left is a, um, a side view or a profile view of one of our patients. Um, the device that is at the corner of the box there is an ultrasound probe. And this picture, this image is taken with, with um, a one of the functional swallowing tests that we know as a modified barium swallow. The modified barium swallow is a test in which we give patients, this is done in radiology, patients are given different types of foods, so thins, pudding, crackers, cookies, et cetera, and we watch the functional swallow. What this study is looking at is the use of ultrasound. Using an ultrasound probe is non-invasive, it's cheap, it is easy to access. So there's a group of us that work together. We are a group of speech pathologists, surgeons, engineers, de computer designers. And so this team led by initially, her name is Suzanne Boyce, they, she, created this team and they actually used the ultrasound and the ultrasound probe to understand better the tongue movement in speech in children. So totally different population, but there are, what we're looking at now is how we can use what her team has created for tongue movement and apply it to swallowing. One of our, our pilot group, we chose Parkinson's disease. We chose Parkinson's for, again, many of these reasons that we talked about. The tongue is a muscle. It is it, the swallowing, as we talked about, is a coordinated muscular activity, which starts at the lips and the tongue. So what this study is looking at is, first, can we see the same things? What can we see on our standard swallowing evaluation versus what can we see in ultrasound? And what these fun graphs show is that at least for these two swallows, we can, they're pretty comparative, which is really exciting. So initially you just have to describe and say, you know, can we do it? And that's what our pilot projects. So this was funded by the University of Cincinnati's College of Medicine and was a, it's a one, it's a one year study, but we're planning on uh, grant funding right now to be able to continue this work. If you have more information about this, please feel free to ask. My email is available um, here and I'm happy for, for you guys to kind of send it out. We've got tons of references for this. And with that being said, this is the end of our talk. So Renee and I, as we said, are two of our team. Our team is, is uh, named after the legacy of Dr. Robin Cotton, who is a, a pediatric airway surgeon, and Rocco Del Vera, the beloved Rocco Del Vera, um, who is the head of CCM, um, our professional voice and swallowing program. This is, uh, uh, this, this, this is our, our fund, which actually helps us to be able to do talks like this, um, allows our learners to be able to travel to to do research um, for unfunded work so with that being said renee and i'll kind of open the floor to a casual conversation for whatever questions you all have we do have a question in the chat um, if there is shortness of breath but no swallowing or voice issues is emst effective to reduce shortness of breath 
I can start just from what we know about in the research at EMST, and EMST is also used by other populations such as people with COPD, with um, patients with muscular um, uh, multiple sclerosis, patients with um, cerebral palsy. So yes, the answer is yes, it can be. However, the nature of the breathlessness needs to be evaluated before you would prescribe this. So if a patient is having a patient's having some breathlessness, um, let's say post COVID, um, we're seeing a lot of that right now. This actually could help to re-strengthen some of the muscles of um, expiration and breathing. Um, but if a patient has, let's say asthma, it might not help asthma. It might exacerbate symptoms of breathlessness because it's exercising an already fatigued or compromised system. So it can in some populations and a pulmonologist or um, a, a good laryngologist ENT team speech language pathology team could help you sort of identify if um, the EMST would be good to treat your specific um, form of dyspnea or breathlessness. There's another question that was sent to me in the chat and direct message. Um, how often should someone practice their voice exercises? I love this question. Every single day, every single day, and I'm not, hyperbolizing. I'm not exaggerating. It is every single day. And Maureen can back me up on this. Exercises for Parkinson's disease must be completed strategically, routinely, frequently, every single day of your life. Like you, like you brush your teeth, you have to do the exercises because Parkinson's disease um, responds to the principles of exercise. You have to do it and repeatedly do it or you're gonna lose it. Like if you don't use it, you lose it, you gotta do it. So every single day, at least 10 minutes, if not more. And along with that, I tell people, you know, because they get, they seem to be self-conscious doing the voice exercises. So, so I, I say, go in your car, you know, yes. turn on the air conditioner, roll up the windows and That's sing your right. heart out. <laughs> That's exactly right. There's no excuse. You can figure out a way to make it happen. I have patients who go in their closet and they <laughs> sing their heart out to their winter coats. Uh -huh. You can, If you want it and you want to make it work, there is a way to do it. And um, you just have to make the commitment that this is going to be something that you continue to do your whole life. Just like we're all supposed to exercise a few times a week, right? We're all supposed to, you know, floss every day. Well, we probably don't always do that. But for Parkinson's disease, if you don't exercise it, you start to lose it. Any other questions? I was just going to add on to, I think, one of the, first, one of the other questions um, about breathing issues, too. You know, make sure that you get an evaluation by your doctor, too. Because I think it's important to really, you know, one of the one of the things that is that is unique for for us at UC, and you know, Renee and I have, I think we didn't talk enough about like our multidisciplinary team. So one of the things and one of the huge advantages that we have is that we actually we see patients together on first evaluations, and so what that multidisciplinary team looks like is that. It, you come into the you come in to, to see one of us as a laryngologist, but you see a speech language pathologist at the same time. Renee and I, if you haven't heard us yet, our brains are different, right? Renee thinks of you as exercise and thinks of different ways. And I think of you as, you know, how can I help? What medication can I do? What surgery can how can I help? So we think differently. And what the thing what is advantageous is that you can <laughs> opinions and we come up with your treatment plan together. And sometimes that is a referral to a pulmonologist. Sometimes that is a referral to a neurologist because sometimes we actually see patients early. And if you're not responding to the, thing, to the treatment plans, then perhaps it's an early stage of Parkinson's and we've actually sent patients the other way to worry. Um, and so I think that's really important is just making sure that you've got a trusted uh, medical team that you can go to and have honest conversations with. Again, I can speak volumes to the folks here at, UC, at University of Cincinnati, but we've got lots of folks in the community as well um, that are you know, breath neurologists, primary care doctors, um, and certainly pulmonologists if you're having breathing difficulties. 
So the evaluation of the endoscopy that we talked about and that we watched, that is part of, that is, that's the diagnostic piece. Now, sometimes we add on other things like that modified barium swallow that we talked about. Sometimes there's an acoustic evaluation, but that initial diagnostic is very important just to be able to then kind of diverge and again, create a treatment plan for you. So making sure that you have the proper evaluations, I think is very, is key. Mm -hmm. I have some questions and comments. Um, I'm not sure. I, usually I'm in other Zoom and we raise our hand, but um, I almost didn't sign up for this because I thought I didn't need it, but maybe it'd be nice to watch and blah, blah, blah. And the more I'm watching, the more I'm seeing, oh my gosh. Um, I've, I was diagnosed about three years ago and I don't feel like I've got most of what, but I do aspirate once in a while on this, that, and the other thing. The other thing is my mother died 12 years ago and she had Parkinson's. And she, I think she did die from aspiration, but she was in hospice at the time. I'll try not to drag on too much. Um, my mom and dad were the old school, you know, if your doctor tells you or doesn't tell you, you just listen to the doctor and the story and her doctor never recommended anything. And my sister knew a speech therapist who start working with her. And we thought, why, why is she doing this? Now you're answering the question because mom was very loud and she got very soft and blah, blah, blah. Um, the other thing you mentioned exercises. Where can I get a list of basic, uh, other than Lala, you know, singing, trying to talk? Um, where can I get a list of some basic things I should be doing? Great question. So the Parkinson's exercises for voice and swallow are very um, specific, very, very intentionally designed and um, evidence-based. They're very driven by the evidence. So I love patients who, who sing for fun. I love patients who do exercise, like just general exercises, but the, the therapy treatments, the therapy exercises are very specific to targeting issues with Parkinson's disease. So um, it's important to get the, that direct um, to, to really focus on the Parkinson's directed exercises. Um, Julia was just mentioning to me that she um, has a list of, of uh, some resources on the um, support group page. Um, we can provide you with a list of, um, of resources. There are so many groups in the community that have fabulous group virtual voice therapy sessions. My, um, my uh, advice to you would be meet with a professional before you start your therapies to make sure you really get the best bang for your buck. Um, so yeah, the, um, I would look here at what Julia has to provide on the website. And then um, of course, reach out to your, to your local speech pathologist so we can give you a, some list of resources and um, can always meet with you too and help you figure out what um, exercises would be best for you personally. Thank you. Sure. And you know, a lot of the other things too, I love your comments and I'm so sorry about your mother. I, you know, I think a lot of this is also new. And as I said, these are, you know, that first paper that I showed you from 2019, it got rejected from about five different places first because everyone said, nope, that's not the treatment. <laughs> so, um, and then the second study is that it's pilot data. So I think as we learn more, we also are able to, to do better. I mean, I oftentimes tell patients with, with any type of, of you know, ENT issue that even though sometimes I don't have an answer today, that doesn't mean there's never gonna be, a, there's never gonna be something. And so, you know, even kind of checking back. So even if you've had that conversation, don't be defeated, um, you know, with your physician, like ask again, you know, or, or, you know, ask again in another year, perhaps it will be, it will, it will become a little bit more um, easy, mainstream. Um, so I think, you know, to be, to be a little bit, 
tongue in cheek too. I, I think that, you know, what Renee and I do is also a little bit more cutting edge than a lot of folks. And I think that, you know, hopefully it's becoming more and more and more as our multidisciplinary teams grow, but it's something that we get to do. It's a privilege, but it's, it's new. So, you know, I don't think that, you know, to your mom, to your mom's point, I don't think that, that you missed it. I, I think it just wasn't available then. Mm -hmm. So there is a question in the chat about recommending uh, physicians in Dayton. Uh, I'm not sure if they just mean a movement disorder specialist or if they're talking about ENT physicians as well. I will say that I heard there is a new movement disorder specialist at Kettering, but I can't find it. I'm looking online and I can't find a name. Um, but in terms of ENT, do you collaborate with anybody in the, our northern area, either one of you? We we collaborate with a few, with the with some of the with a group of speech pathologists. Yeah, that's under, with the Blaine Block Institute. Mm -hmm. um, they are they are excellent. They have a physicians group. They have an ENT group, but I don't know that any of them specialize necessarily in Parkinson's voice or swallow. Um, we do have a Westchester office, not that that's super close to Dayton, but um, Renee and I both spend time at, at both locations. Um, so again, from a physician standpoint, not that I know of, I, there's no laryngologist uh, in the Dayton area yet that I know of. But again, check back. There's, you know, lots of people change. There's lots of movement all over the country right now. So it doesn't mean never. Yeah, I'm not finding anybody. I would say from a therapy perspective or point of view, uh, our colleagues at the Blaine Block Institute in Dayton usually see patients for the therapy who are Dayton based and then come over to the Westchester office, which is a little bit closer and see one of our laryngologists, Dr. Howell, Friedman, Dr. Dion or Dr. Kosla, and then they go back over to Dayton for their, um, for their voice therapy care. Um, I don't, yeah, I personally don't know of a, of a um, ENT, um, neurologically focused ENT out in the Dayton area. Um, Renee, can you say that institute again? Is sure, it and Blaine? I, and I wrote, oh, I just sent it to Julia. I thought okay. I said to everyone. It's the Blaine Block Institute. Okay. And they have some phenomenal speech pathologists um, that we collaborate with a lot and we love them. They also, um, I do believe, um, offer some virtual therapy. Um, so we could look into that. And if they are full, um, then we could help you virtually as well. That is one little silver lining of the pandemic is that we are seeing so many patients for, um, for, for therapy over video. And you know what? It works. In yeah. fact, we just did a study. Patients are about two times more likely to show up for their therapy if they are offered the telepractice option. So if, if you feel like that could, could be a way to hop into some therapy and get some work done, please inquire. It, it's, it's quite enjoyable, to be honest. You know, I could be in sweatpants right now and you guys would never know. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, it is 12.06. If we have one or two more questions, we can take it. If not, then we can part ways for this Saturday. Anyone have another question? I, I have just one quick. Um, I see this is being recorded. So is this available? These monthly classes are available to go back if anybody wants to? Yes, they'll be available. Uh, this particular recording will be available in about a week on our website. And the past recordings are also currently available on our website. Thank you. You're welcome. And again, um, thanks a lot, Dr. Hal and Renee for your time this morning. I, I always learn something from these sessions. So we really appreciate you doing this. This is a population near and dear to our hearts. And like Dr. Howell said earlier, like it is a true honor to work um, with this population, work with colleagues like Maureen and, um, and now our new colleague, Julia. Um, so thank you. Thank you for having us and for asking us to do this. Okay, everybody enjoy this hot day. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye, everybody. Bye, Cheryl. Thank you.